All right. Welcome back, everybody, to the episodes that I do. It's been quite some time since I've been on this uh, here idiot tube. Um, I've done a few things with my life. I've gotten married. I've uh, gone to the gym a lot. And I've been working my ass off, and that's about it. So I haven't had time to do YouTube. Uh, and that's about all I'm going to say about what I've been doing with my life. Because today, we got our good friend Julian Langer back on the show. And he's got a special announcement to make. Uh, I'm going to let him make that announcement because um, uh, it's his. So, Julian, go ahead. I mean, um, special announcement. All right, I had a short story that's been published. It's a little, it's a, it's a book. Let um, it's available to read for free online through Forged Books website, and um, it's also um, there's a print version also done. I don't know if that's on Active Distros website yet, but it's a short story book um, called Breath Night Rebellion, um, which. Uh, is or kind of a was my attempt to do a kind of conversation about decolonizing this archipelago this island that i live on um and what does and just stuff about what does uh, a pre-britain kind of pre-romanization prehistoric um indigenous culture look like here um and with that i wanted to do a um a story of indigenous victory here so it's it's very fictional <laughs> it's it's um yeah but that, that's what it is and i actually have it pulled up on the screen right now for anybody for everyone watching it to see you also you know it's not just fiction you also have your artwork uh throughout the piece yeah there's some poems miss yes and um i'm just showing some of that right now unfortunately i haven't figured out how to make it so that you could see this as well but um why don't we start off actually uh just talking about your visual art for a moment because I haven't heard you say anything about it before, and it's always uh, included with your work. So, what is what is your what's going on with that? Well, the, the, it's only actually been included um, since I started doing things with Forged Books in the last year or so, um, which has been uh, really nice. Um, it was the first thing I did with including the visual art was. The, um, the poetry collection Affirming the Open, which uh, we spoke about last time. Um, and that was, there's something uh, for me in the process of trying to communicate something um, or express something that is different um, about, um, about doing visual art, about doing drawings or paintings and yeah that was something in terms of me expressing uh what I'm seeking to express through these creative works um that felt kind of for lack of a better word right to do um and um and I you know I was inspired partly by um other writers who do the same who include kind of visual art alongside um alongside their writing and yeah that, and that kind of moved me and kind of made me kind of feel like yeah um it's something that's not perhaps not going to be responded to with like hostility or anything like that so yeah um and and lou with forged forged books is he's been always really kind of cool to support that and wanted to include that and encouraged it which has been nice um there was visual art as well in the um booklet full version of um my anti-cult philosophy as well which um 
uh, which is really awesome. Um, and uh, yeah, and then in this one, I wanted to create a couple maps for it just because I never actually created a map myself. Um, and so I just had a little go at just playing about with what in my head would be the uh, the terrain of the main two places that the um, that the story kind of involve. Um, but there was also just a lot of the art, like some of the kind of big full page pieces of art that aren't the maps. That was me doing stuff and then just kind of going, oh, this could be included possibly. It wasn't done necessarily for the book. That makes sense. Um, yeah. And uh, what I've noticed in seeing your art, maybe I exaggerated a bit when I said always included, but um, there's definitely a style that you have and it makes me wonder what your method is. If you're doing these like uh, when you're out in the woods or something like that, or if you're sitting at a desk or if you have some sort of like ritual you're doing while you create them. I'm I'm quite shit for rituals and like and it, 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 and in terms of method, um, I don't really have a method other than kind of fuck about and find out. Um, it's kind of that would be the best way to describe my method. Like I'm, yeah, I'm not. I don't really have a ritual. The um, there's a, a part of it is somewhat kind of. Um, inspired by the kind of automatic art style of like surrealists and all that there's a somewhat kind of inspiration from that in terms of just um particularly the things that are you know i've, I've, I've done a fair few more scribble like automatic drawings that are just kind of you know that are out there to see um but it's it, there's no like real method or technique or approach it's just when i find what i want to do i do and then and that's how it happens. Uh, okay, because yeah, I'm I'm never really talked about this on my show before, but I used to have a passing interest in uh, occult, chaos magic type of stuff, and uh, part of that approach to the occult is what's called sigils, mm -hmm. and there's uh, various techniques that. Uh, a magician will practice to induce some sort of extreme, uh, not ordinary consciousness when they are approaching uh, their drawing of the sig sigil. So, and various other yeah. techniques sort of reminded me of that. But and there's some level of inspiration from chaos magic and an appreciation in terms of like the stuff that's obviously kind of visually more similar to sigil, like you know symbols and whatnot um but yeah it, it, there's not like a, a set ritual or anything like that and it's, it's not you know perhaps chaos magic inspired is better than calling it chaos magic if that makes sense yeah for sure yeah well cool um so uh what else has been going on with you well um not like you know i'm i'm still studying and still training but I, you know the main thing has been this this booklet and what that's been uh, you know getting that doing that and um you know i've not been writing loads i've done a little review of the film prey um recently which went out but other than that it's been um i've been studying and and doing like courses and whatnot has been right. my, my main thing and um doing kind of badger set checking and all that well let's Even talk anti call stuff let's talk about the the book a little bit more then um so first of all how is this first word pronounced like you said it already but the way i pronounce it is bretonike 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 yeah which is the um as far as i'm aware and as far as it seems the historical records go is the like the original name for this archipelago um, before Britain. Um, Britain is the, um, as I understand it, is the name uh, given by the Romans to this 
this place. Um, okay. And yeah. Yeah, I read that in there, but I couldn't, you know, I didn't know what parts of this were history and what parts of this were uh, were the fiction parts. So, yeah, uh, that, that's then, part of my um, my understanding of the history. Um, and then, yeah, the way I was pronouncing it in my head was Breton Nike <laughs> or Breton Nike. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> I knew that couldn't be right. Hopefully not. <laughs> yeah. Um. So, uh, do you want to go through, uh, summarize chapters or, uh, how do you want to talk about this? Cause it's not, it's, uh, 44 pages on the PDF and, uh, it's divided into how many chapters? Eight. Let me um, see. Can't remember how many chapters that there are in terms of the actual story chapters. It's introduced, um, there's. Uh, in terms of the book, the, the, the first thing there's a quote from Freddie Perlman, um, mm -hmm. and um, and then there's a poem shortly after that uh, by John Moore, um, who I mean, John Moore is um, particularly for um, me and Forged Books is someone kind of just wanting to kind of uh, reintroduce into the conversation a bit this side of the ocean um and um just because just out of an appreciation for for john um and then um sorry something's come off my computer screen technology. oh no problem um, <laughs> when uh and just yeah tell us a little bit more about who he is so john moore it, it was a um He's a British anarchist, writer, thinker, philosopher, whatever you want to call him. Um, and he he wrote the um, kind of the first real primitivist piece that I connected with um, uh, years and years ago, a primitivist primer. Um, and but he wasn't kind of the 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 approach that he took is not what we kind of generally consider primitivism today in terms of just the pure uh, anthropological realism and just this kind of very, um, you know, uh, Zerzan and Tucker approach to kind of discourse and whatnot. Um, he was very, very inspired by Perlman and, um, and by Peter Lamble Wilson. Um, he was, you know, he, He's the first person I've I came across using the term maximalist anarchism, um, doing that kind of thing. And his and his writings, all of his pieces, they're wildly different from each other. Like there, there's there's such a huge amount of variation in his um, in his thinking, and that like he's really not sedentary. He's very nomadic as a kind of as someone seeking to express. Kind of ideas about what anarchy is and about you know affirming freedom and affirming life and all all, all that's involved in it's some of his pieces are really some of them are really kind of uncomfortable and just bizarre there's, there's this um this short story he's got um which involves a lot of um a <laughs> lot of like castration and stuff and it's it's utterly it's it's really weird i just I, I think it's just i think it's the one his piece called um love bite if i remember correctly um there's a whole collection of like loads of his writings that's on the anarchist library which is really great um and um and he's just got this other piece um which is uh, a long kind of eco-feminist style piece about little red riding hood and the kind of the themes of that and it's um very there's points of that which are quite quite uncomfortable as well but really interesting and, and just weird and just like just is he's one of those things where you just kind of go like some of it is like brilliant some of it's bizarre but also just intriguing but there's nothing that doesn't kind of draw me in to his thought if that makes sense um but the piece of his that i love most is his um uh anarchy and ecstasy piece which um i i consider very um very inspirational with his stuff about like the wilderness and 
just this i his his approach to kind of writing from a non in it's not great sweeping kind of this is the truth this is what is this is like he's putting ideas forth in a in a much more gentle interpretative interpretative way which is just which for me feels way more grounded than this kind of like this is what's happening i know everything and this and this is what's gonna happen sort of thing which dominates a lot of our conversations with this is what capitalism is this is what socialism is and we need to do a this to get to a that and it's just it just feels more there's something about john john moore's writing which is just beautiful um mm. and the poem that's in the um that's in breast night rebellion um was in uh at the magazine i forget if it's green anarchy or green anarchist magazine but it's in one of one of those um and it's just uh his poems are just like on one level they're kind of standard anarchist poems but on another level they're just really flavorful and lovely if that makes sense yeah for sure uh and uh if you have anything specific you would want anyone to read i'll definitely put that in the show description as well i think the two that i my two big suggestions uh would be um anarchy and ecstasy and the primitivist primer um just partly partly because primitive primer is so different from a lot of what is like primitivist discourse today as i encounter it um and just anarchy next deep anarchy next deep because that's the one that really moved me it's kind of going like fucking hell i really really like this guy's writing and what he's bringing forth into the conversation awesome yeah. um so yeah and freddie perlman i guess i just assumed people would know who he is but i shouldn't uh assume that so let's just talk about him really quick too yeah uh, uh you could go ahead or well perlman's a writer that i i i have a love and hate thing with like i his, his earlier writings when he's very kind of um lefty socialisty i just i i i, I don't it doesn't grab me in it and it's it's very um it's that kind of it's that politics writing which just feels dead and cold and analytical and there's no flavor to it um whereas obviously his um against leviathan against history his story like it's fucking brilliant and and i love it um it's one of the best works of history um or speculative fiction that i am um, that I appreciate. Um, and I think that Perlman kind of breaches that or is that kind of that, that point of differentiation between kind of anti-civ anarchist thoughts and kind of left anarchist thought, that kind of point where that kind of, you can say, here is the, here's the moment when it's kind of where there is that differentiation and it's, a you know, and it's that, moving away in my in my experience that moving away from politics into we're talking we're doing things about living beings and 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 the experience of that yeah um, that's a yeah that's a really good way to put it yeah um but no so i am um, i think that there's a um with Perlman being uh, perhaps a bit older and kind of less kind of noticeable out there that there's a there's a lacking somewhat um like when people refer to like the best kind of the 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 go-to green anarchist thinkers rarely see Perlman referenced in, in terms of you know just on the kind of I guess the sophomoric level conversation not people who are kind of really invested in anarchist conversation um the kind of introduction into green anarchist conversation sort of thing usually it's got to read tucker zerzan Derek jensen and ted kaczynski though the ones that people go to first is like these are your anti-civ guys to to read and it's like no like there's there's 
I love I love Zerzan's writing. I appreciate Zerzan. The other three, <laughs> you know. yeah. So, but Pullman's definitely um, his against Leviathan against history is because it's the first piece of writing that I've come across, or the earliest piece of writing that I've come across that puts forward the kind of the, the claim or affirms the process that wherever there is Leviathan, wherever there is states or civilization, there's resistance to that. Um, and while he's doing it as a history, which is kind of God's eye top down, I think given that he's not doing it, it's not written as like an academic, these are the facts, this is the truth. This is, it's done much more like a story. So while it's got that God's eye perspective, it's like a God's eye perspective that kind of undoes its own God's eye perspective and brings it down to earth. So. I can't hear you, mate. You've, you've gone dead on me. <laughs> yeah, it's a really amazing book. I second all the all the things you just said about it. Um, I don't know if this would be considered his earlier or later stuff, but uh, uh, the continuing appeal of white nationalism is yeah. one of my other favorite pieces of writing. It just he yeah. he nails uh, the arguments that he makes. It's not one I've read for years, but it is one that I, I definitely appreciated when I was first meeting Perlman, um, which was longer ago than I wish to say. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, so you got two great uh, authors quoted in the beginning. Yeah. Um, and then uh, there's a poem by Lou, because I, I said to Lou, um, when I sent it to him, I said, do you want to publish this? And if you want to publish it, I, my condition is that you do an introduction for it. Um, because the book, the story was very much inspired by, um, Lou basically encouraging me to do another piece of fiction. Um, and so I was just, I wanted him to do an introduction. And when he sent, sent me the introduction, he said, it's probably not what you were anticipating as an introduction, but I've done it. I've done a poem and it's a fucking like, beautiful poem only like uh six or seven or eight lines long but it is it's a lovely um little little piece that was just wonderful to receive um yeah there's um it's the, the main change that in terms of the in the editing process from what i originally sent lou was that because i wanted him to do the introduction i'd written a long introduction and that got split into an introduction and an outroduction um, with the introduction being kind of the justification for the, for the story, if that makes sense. Yes. And then the outroduction being the process of writing it. Yeah. Sorry. Sorry about the uh, audio thing, by the way, oh. I mute my mic when you're talking cause I don't wear an earpiece and then it's a touchy button. So <laughs> don't worry. So, okay, so after that, you get into an introduction uh, and then the meat of the work, uh, the yeah. actual story itself. So I don't know how much of it you want to give away, but at least for the introduction, what do you want to summarize that a little bit? And explain, summarize the introduction. Yeah, an introduction yeah. to the introduction. <laughs> so, yeah, well, the introduction... Um, Basically, I the, the, I kind of affirm the main points of inspiration for for the story. Um, so the first one is Lou's kind of encouragement, um, and the next bit is uh, Aragorn's um, the fight for Turtle Island, um, which was a book that I read kind of kind of also not automatically, was immediately um, before starting this starting this project um because i found that a really beautiful um collection of um stories and um conversations and life experiences uh and there was something about um aragorn's uh description of desiring a place that is here and at the same time, paradoxically, not here. And that thing with like Turtle Island, like being 
what we call America, um, but at the same time not being there because of colonialism and all that shit. Um, and with that, that really resonated with my experience of kind of feeling like, fuck, I live on this archipelago that's been like colonized and domesticated for so fucking long. And just the level of um, scarring and ruination that's happened here. There's all oh, that's just feeling, feeling like that. And then having kind of not having arrived at a language to which to describe that there's Aragorn doing that thing of a place that is here because Breton Ike is here like all the you know the the mountains and the cliffs and that kind of that landscape is here yeah we've I say we've civilization has chopped down the the forests we don't have the primeval forests we've barely got any ancient forests left anyway um fucking <laughs> there was a recent thing of a 600 year old oak tree and Somerset getting uh, fell down to expand the highway, um, which is fucking ah uh, shit. And just uh, my love to everyone who was involved in defending that, um, which includes a couple of close friends. Um, uh, but yeah, just having that that kind of desiring that pre-domesticated space, um, and then also this. The thing that one of the things that I really that really spoke to me in Aragorn's book um, was this kind of desiring what the way I put it was like desiring tribe, um, desiring that kind of tribal connection, not as like an ethnic thing or or as a kind of collective identity thing, but as a relational thing of kind of face to face relational being with individuals um, in that in that kind of way. Um, the intimacy yeah yeah that connection that intimacy that 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 being with that we were kind of talking about in our last conversation um and there was something of that in there and weirdly midway through i say weirdly um fucking horrifically midway through writing breast night rebellion i lost one of the most significant individuals in my world which was my um my nana um my grandmother and there was a lot I was able to because there's a grandmother character in the text and the main the main kind of aspect of the story is that the story is of an elder person in a Celtic tribe describing the events of Bretonite Rebellion. Um and so there was a lot of her put into both the grandmother character and the elder character who's talking to the to the tribe of Celts and kind of affirming at the end that they're coming to the end of their life. You know, the story, encouraging them to keep on the story, keep on that, you know, fire of resistance and rebellion. Um, and yeah, so there's like the introductions all on, on that process of kind of getting there. There's also, there's an affirmation on a kind of more political kind of praxis activist praxis thing of um being also inspired by uh clee Benelli. i hope i'm pronouncing that right his um work um unknowable because that just so resonates with um aspects of my own uh practice which i describe as non-localizable localism um which you know i'm not going to say is the same thing as because it's not because i'm not doing indigenous resistance because i'm I, I, I'm doing wildlife defense and care and rewilding and there's similarities and crossovers, but it's not the same. Um, but there's, but there was something of being inspired by uh, Clee's writing as well in kind of my forming the narrative that I went with. Um, but yeah. That's my, that's the introduction to the introduction. Yeah. And so people who know me, you know, in, in real life are going to be familiar with, Clee's work as well, because that's this area that I live in. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't have it on the screen, but the full title of that says a little bit more about what the theme of that essay is, mm -hmm. which is against an indigenous anarchist theory. Yeah. And uh, yeah, so what 
something that should stick out by now after hearing you describe this is that you're not dealing with light themes. Uh, a lot of, I mean, this is very serious work. So whether you're talking about um, uh, against Leviathan, against history, or you're talking about Cleves writing or Aragorn's writing, uh, these are all very deep, um, painful stories about our shared collective past. And so uh, for anybody reading this, it shouldn't be, the expectation shouldn't be that just because it's a, a story means that it's going to be easy to take. Yeah, it's, um, yeah, it's, it was kind of somewhat, it's not easy to take. I don't, I don't think. And there's a, um, there is definitely a seriousness with the, um, with the, the narrative and the, and the subject matter. Um, and, at the same time, at the same time, in terms of it is fiction, um, and I put it out there, kind of. I'll just put it out there. I wanted a, I wanted a story about victory. I wanted a story about something that had a ending that I could find beautiful, and that you know that I, I know is, I know is myth. I know isn't, you know, but just to have that. Um, have that possibility as something that, that I could I can do even in fiction, um, because I don't I'm 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 not at all one for lessening the seriousness and the fucking the horribleness of the situation, and I don't want to be really real about that. And I also I don't know the future. I don't you know. I, and we had this whole thing about we spoke about like the future and whatnot, historizing in our previous conversation. Um, I'm not one for de defeatism and like, and, and, and kind of, the, and the idea of, um, and I'm not one for escapism um, on that kind of, that, those sorts of narratives of like, there's nothing that can be done. Should we just escape or something like that? Um, I, I, I believe in challenge. I believe in rebellion. I believe in, uh, in being being with and being being here and and with that feeling deep fucking feelings that are that are real and true and difficult um and and with that you know there's something about having even in myth just the idea of of victory even if it's an absurd idea of victory that's like that's kind of stupid like because it's because it's not real if that makes sense there's something there's something about that that it w is desirable to me um so which is not to detract from any of the fucking horribleness you know, all the seriousness you know not to lessen any of that but just to have that as something that is that is there um, one of the other, so obviously one of the themes that you're touching on a lot is indigeneity, generally. Yeah. And uh, I'm not familiar with the history of the Celts, or really I'm not familiar with a lot of history uh, in Europe when it comes to, well, I guess prehistory. Um, do you, how... I guess what I want to ask is how much are you dedicated to exploring the history of the Celts and other indigenous groups uh, in particular? And um, how much are you um, interested in exploring the theme of indigeneity, which I know Aragorn wrote a lot about how difficult and Klee about how difficult these concepts are to work with. And I was curious about, yeah, the way that you approach it. So I, I'm not a kind of scholar on the matter. And like I, I've read, I've read a bit. Um, and I, you know, I, I put out there in the introduction, just my two main sources of like, reference for kind of, you know, for history. Um, which is two books. Um, 
one uh, titled Home um, and one titled Celts in Search of a Civilization. Um, and my understanding is of the, for this island here that I live on is that Celts are not the first people here in terms of what we call first peoples. They, they would have arrived at some point. Um, I've not seen anything referenced of a kind of colonial invasion type thing. So which, which to me, um, as I wanted to do in the, in the story, um, is a kind of thing of welcoming sort of thing. As my understanding of the history is that Celts made their way up through Europe and then onto Bretonike, um, as a kind of thing of moving away from the spread of Leviathan, the spread of civilization. Um, Celt actually, as a term, originates from uh, Romans, uh, which is just to refer to anyone who's like barbaric or savage or kind of, it was a, it was that sort of term. That's that's the origin, original meaning as according to the information that I have access to. Um, yeah. So, yeah, so that's kind of the, the movement there um and i'm not you know i have i'm not from an indigenous in terms of but i'm not from a celtic family really i have some in my grandmother's like some bits of scottish and irish there in terms of my genetics but that to me um it's not a big part of my identity and it's not and i don't think that makes me indigenous or anything like that um and in terms of talking about indigenous people here, well, that conversation usually looks like, which is fucking horrible, is like far right wing, like just kind of, you know, talking about the native population, that's indigenous British people talking about like an anti-immigrant conversation, um, which is just grotesque and also just, bullshit because like english people are not like are not indigenous to here like anyone who has an understanding of the history of these islands um will know that these islands have just been repeatedly invaded and colonized and it's just a you know there, there is no such thing as an indigenous culture here really um if we're being kind of honest about the situation um and which is kind of for someone who's I'm quite drawn to the kind of the when I read about in, indigeneity, which is from a very kind of reedy, heady place. I don't have an experience of being indigenous. And I've not, you know, I've not been to Canada or the United States, and I've not I've not been to areas where you really have a kind of indigenous uh culture and movement. Um I've just not traveled that far yet in my life. Um so my coming at this is somewhat intellectual um, or kind of just less intellectual, just heady rather than experiential, if that makes sense. Yeah, um, for sure. And, but there is with that, there is a sincere desire for what I perhaps perceive or project or whatever as an indigenous experience, a real experience of being being here and that and what I perhaps romantically um, kind of theorize as like a, co a connection to the space that is kind of really rooted and in that kind of sense of tribal connection that that, that is, you know, with the land, not in kind of stupid nationalism, pride in land and all that stuff, but as real sincere relationship. Um, it's something that I again, something that I appreciated from Aragon's book um, in that it, it talks about this potential for someone who is not indigenous to a space to become indigenous to a space. And, um, and that's something that does really kind of, there's something there which appeals to me and is, you know, it's attractive and I have a desire for. Um, and 
I don't know what that looks like in terms of I don't have like a, a an idea for a ritual or a process or anything like that. But there's something about that which I guess that I'm in terms of my own practice of kind of connecting to wildlife and doing wildlife care and going on hikes and things and whatnot and trying to be with the the space that I live on, like something of that there. Um, but yeah, that's what really interests me and kind of that I'm really drawn to. And partly because this, this short story was very much written for people living on this archipelago like you know that was a a thing of like wanting to introduce uh, in a way that's not doing fucking far-right bullshit and in with that far-right bullshit including kind of fucking national anarchist bullshit type you know conversation like talking about tribal experience of real connected face-to-face relationships with people um and having that intimacy and with yeah doing that that process of kind of becoming in indigenous or having starting something of a conversation around those lines so that was um yeah that's something that i wanted to do with this yeah and aragorn has another essay on this topic uh i think it's something about being a tourist or tourism and yeah. I'll, I'll include that, but it's another good one. He was really sensitive to this, uh, this problem of not uh, the problem of people who aren't indigenous and to where they live and uh, would like to be or, uh, and he has a lot of good writing about that. Um, for me, I mean, the whole question of indigeneity is, totally fucked because and it's also a lot different than where you're living because uh there's a lot of indigenous uh tribes here first of all then uh and the people who are like racist nationalists aren't from here at all like it's they can't even claim to be even a little bit and then the third thing that makes it a really hard question for me is I'm Jewish. So, and not just like a little bit, like a hundred percent. So my family is, I mean, if I'm going to say I'm indigenous to Palestine or, uh, you know, as whatever my family's ancestral record goes, that's a whole additional series of problems because of the state of Israel. Mm. So it's like, it's always the question of indigeneity is always something I'm curious about and tiptoeing around because I just, it seems like tackling uh, a pile of needles <laughs> to, uh, to try to figure out what's going on there. Yeah. I am um, particularly on the matter of uh, being Jewish. Um, I, you know, I, Coming from, you know, I, I, I guess half Jewish in terms of if I'm going to do things kind of genetically correctly, but I've never been, I haven't been close to the other side of the family for most of my life. So, um, but uh, just the awareness of how my experience of displacement um, has impacted on my thoughts on this has been something that's been a big point of reflection to me, particularly when approaching writing this so thinking of celts as people who arrived on this archipelago um as being displaced people who are fleeing leviathan and seeking to kind of not do that as much as possible um and just what that where i'm kind of what's what's my stuff what am i putting into this that it's mine what's what stuff that's like that fits the history as I understand it and where does that, where does that go? And there's, and, and yeah, it's fucking, as you know, I'm thinking about writing a, a piece on indigeneity when I'm not indigenous to this place. And I, I can't, there was a, there was a kind of thing of who the fuck am I to talk about this stuff and, or, or, you know, 
try and put something forward on this conversation. Um, and then the one way I know how to do that, where I can kind of keep myself, uh, where I can feel comfortable with what I'm doing, um, is just to do the kind of the awkward thing of just doing my own personal experience and keeping it on my feelings and not doing this thing of I'm doing politics and I'm doing uh, and, and like not doing definite statements and whatnot and keeping it as a thing of like this is all like this is all fucking difficult and just and and all uncertain and not doing not doing anything with any level of um of assertiveness that's more than just kind of I'm asserting that this is fucking difficult (laughs) yeah um yeah it it is very difficult and decolonization is such a big part of anarchist thought right now and Mm. uh especially where I live I don't know how widespread the notion is where you live but a couple years ago um so a couple years ago I think it was 2018 um the uh, the theme of the Anarchist Studies Network conference was decolonize, um, uh, which was an interesting, an interesting event, um, uh, and and it's it's something that crops up here. It's never like the kind of a big thing as like, from what I see of kind of conversation, but it's usually kind of about. So obviously the sun never sets on the British Empire um, and like it's usually a thing about like challenging this state about things that are not here if that makes sense like challenging challenging the state about things that are like overseas and the legacy and whatnot and trying and like reparations and those sorts of narratives in terms of decolonized discourse it's what I I see um but and with that um and i'm not saying this is wrong or bad because i think that those conversations are ones that are good to have um it's often forgotten that this is a colonized space this is this is a an, an area of the world that has experienced colonization interesting um, yeah uh, which i think for me is it's why I wanted to bring things back to in, in that kind of introduction um, or just before the introduction, the first thing of the, of the booklet is referencing Freddie Pellman, you know, that all of this, all of this is fucking colonized space. And, um, and Leviathan here is just as bad as Leviathan going out there. If that makes sense. I don't know about just as bad, but yeah. Is his, from. is that book of his, the one uh, where he's talking about the necessity of the internal colonization before the external colonization or am I um, mixing that with something else? It's, it's a sense. That's essentially one of the things that he puts forward in, in that it's, there's a whole thing about, um, he doesn't, he doesn't do a thing as, as I read him and I interpret him. Um, he doesn't do a thing of, uh, of these are the ones who are winning or he, these are the ones who are losing. It's that all of this is all of civilization is repressed by civilization. And with that, as long as there's been civilization, there's been resistance to civilization. Um, and doing this, this thing in a way where it's, it kind of, um, for me, uh, quite beautifully just cuts through the kind of us, them collective thing of like, these are the good guys. These are the bad guys. And actually it's, we're all, this fucking machinery is fucking horrific to everyone. Like in, in that way. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, that's a, a huge topic. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and it's one that's difficult to deal with. Um, I don't know what I want to say more about that. You did, well, I, maybe we'll come back to it in a bit, uh, especially because I know you wrote another piece recently, which is a review of a movie. <laughs> and uh, the movie is one of a series of movies belonging to the uh, the Predator franchise. <laughs> um, and I haven't seen any of them. 
So you haven't seen any of them. No. Uh, and, uh, I do want to see this, but I feel like I have to watch every single one of them before I do. So yeah, by the time I do that, I'm not going to be, feel like I read any spoilers when it comes to your review. So, um, (laughs) Uh, I guess a warning for anybody who hasn't seen the movie yet, but uh, let's talk about your review of it. Okay. Um, oh, yeah. And what the movie's called, which is uh, <laughs> Prey. Prey. Um, yeah. I'm, I'm, I, I'm, 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 I'm kind of uh, shocked that, you, that you've not seen any of the Predator films. Um, it's um, like... Uh, my early teenage years, like Predator films and like uh, the Alien films, were just ones that were, um, yeah. There's it's been a it's been a solid thing in my in my in my life of kind of liking these sci-fi franchise films, like <laughs> just being a, a nerdy child. Yeah, um, it's just for whatever reason that one passed me by. I've seen plenty of uh, Terminator or RoboCop or. I've never seen RoboCop. Oh, oh, you're missing <laughs> out. <laughs> it, it, it feels too American for me to watch. It you know, is. Whenever, whenever, it whenever, is I've, whenever I've, I've gone like, oh, it just feels too American. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's definitely American. <laughs> <laughs> but um, no, on Prey, so the, the big, 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 big spoiler is that I, I liked the film. I like the film and, and I like the Predator films. I, I, I will go as far to say as even the bad ones, even the ones that I know, are like the Alien versus Predator and Alien versus Predator 2, I know they're bad and I like them. Um, and, I, and, I, and I feel no shame in, in, in enjoying like shit cinema that is just enjoyable, for, even if it's shit. Um, but I, no, I, I appreciated um, Prey and I am, um, I won't do. I'll, I'll avoid spoilers as much as possible. Um, but the um, yeah, I did this review where, um, and I didn't. I I I I didn't really do it as a review though, because a, a review or, or like a critique or analysis is like is it would be explaining it and saying these are these are the the true facts about about this. And I and I, I, I did a I did a. Wrote a piece which was my thoughts on prey so it's my reaction is it your reaction piece a response said the well, I, I do i do just just uh it, it's, it's my feelings it's, it's what it's what it made me feel <laughs> <laughs> react or response feels too much no <laughs> I, I was kidding <laughs> julian um, linger reacts <laughs> to <laughs> the movie prey uh no <laughs> <laughs> um the um the 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 main things that I really appreciated about it um were the first thing was how it did um it differentiated as I as I saw it between um different um killing and hunting in different ways and the and the differentiation between those ways and what you know it differentiated between sports hunting, culling hunter gathering hunting and killing and um hunting and killing as self-defense um that's how i interpreted it uh, those four kind of different ways of doing it in a way which i i really appreciated particularly regarding culling because i obviously that's why i never shut up about <laughs> well, it's like an ontology of killing that's interesting. yeah that, that, that there's something on that in um in the film, which I thought was uh, just done really well and um, quite beautifully. Uh, there's also this quality of, um, of using kind of, it, it's set within an indigenous kind of pre-colonized with colonizers being there, but still like b- before kind of colonization has kind of completed um uh it's it's set within a landscape where you've got indigenous kind of life happening um pre colonizer um and um 
but with that, it invites the notion of using um, the weapons of your enemies against them. Um, so, like the the hero, the heroine of the uh, story, she uses the um, the pistol of the French colonizer, um, and she uses the weapons of the predator um, against the predator. And there's this, which to me is um. I, I appreciate it because there's this kind of um, puritanism and kind of uh, absolutes kind of thing of, uh, if you, you know, the response to if you're anti-technology um, is, well, why do you use a computer or why do you drive a car? Or those sorts of, you know, if you're anti-kind of industrialism or anything like that, that's the response. Um, or if you're, like, if you talk about anti-property, like particularly if someone of a more libertarian right perspective, like you, talk, and they'll say, "Well, just give me all your stuff then." If you're if you're anti-property, I'll yeah. take all, all your possessions. That was back when I did those conversations. That was the response I'd get every single time. Um, and um, or if you're like, anti-state, like they say, "Well, you, you use like, you use the NHS here, or you use you know the roads or whatever." Like right, it's all done. It basically, diff- oh. A variety of ways that people try to call you a hypocrite because it's yeah. the, the best that they could come up with. Yeah, that that kind of bullshit response. But it does it does that thing of of using the weapons of your enemy against them, kind of quite um, for me quite beautifully because she the she uses them, but she doesn't go like oh I'm going to keep these and I'm going to like these these are now mine or I'm going to hold on to these or we need to take all their things and kind of become like them. Um, uh, in a way that I just, I appreciated. Um, and like with Breton Knight Rebellion, um, it's a story of indigenous victory. And I, and I, and I think that that's, I do think that's important. I have a feeling that that's, that's, that's important and needed. Uh, not, not just, and I use the word just there very intentionally, not just as a kind of, feel good pick me up because sometimes we need feel good pick me ups because this fucking life is really difficult and sometimes that's needed um but more so because there's a certain uh i guess impossible attitude that gets kind of quite that i that i notice in terms of like talking about you talk about the idea of decolonizing the british isles or breton like like the response is well that's impossible you you can't you can't do that you, that's, that's never going to happen you know there's always going to be a civilization here now it's all built but like i go fuck no i don't want to talk about that being impossible i want to have this conversation of like you know i want to do the fucking situation of situationist thing of being realistic by doing the impossible like that that's the the thing that i want to do so i i appreciate um the film for doing that 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 kind of narrative which many would kind of do no that's impossible it's impossible that uh a woman because it's a it's a woman and she's using like she's she's not trained in the army and it's not like in the first film where it was big muscly men with guns and they they couldn't you know it's it's a it's a woman with like primitive tools and you know and she's not how could she stand up to this no, I, I want to do that thing of yes, she did it, like, and that's that's fucking, and I, I I appreciate that narrative. Have you seen Avatar? I have seen Avatar. <laughs> so, a lot of people, uh, anarchists and socialists, wrote about that movie, and um, mostly very critical. Mm-hmm. Uh, how would you compare this to that? Along like. Do you think it's going to be received as critically as Avatar, or do you think there's some redeeming qualities about it that you know people are going to take to it a little better? It's very different to Avatar as a narrative, um, as I experience it. I experience it as very diff- different to Avatar. Um, uh, like, it's not kind of white savior in the way that avatar was white savior um and the the difference is um 
as I encounter it, um, was Avatar is doing noble, savage type romanticism in a way that's kind of uh, just I- idealistic, whereas this doesn't, for, for me, I didn't encounter Nauru as the, the heroine as being kind of done as a noble, savage figure, but being done as um, something far more akin to a kind of uh, Nietzschean self-overcoming kind of, she's, she's, it's a, it's a, there's a heavy kind of individualism there, which uh, is different from Avatar's kind of, uh, just the kind of the bullshitty aspects of Avatar. Does that make sense? <laughs> yeah. Um, and with that kind of really quite, the profound differences in the narrative, um, like the, um, Yeah, and and the the kind of the cosmology is different because it's kind of Avatar is this thing of all oh, space being out there is kind of um, it's optimistic about like what's out there in space and you know out there off of out of Earth and kind of disregards Earth in that way, whereas this is that kind of cosmic pessimist thing that is kind of is there within the predator narrative, which is kind of this idea of um, there could be beings out there who view living beings on this planet as game to hunt. Um, that um, makes sense. Yeah. Just something that I, this is going to sound like so stupid to anybody watching this, but from my own knowledge, uh, is there only one predator or are there multiple predators? In the first film, there's one predator that you uh, meet. Um, in the second film, there is uh, like one main predator. And at the end, you uh, meet some of his friends. Um, uh, and uh, then in... Uh, Alien versus Predator, the first one. Um, there's three Predators, um, and then some more at the very, very end. Um, and I can't remember how many there are in Alien versus Predator 2. And then in the film Predators, um, there are more. And Predators does an interesting thing of there's actually like um, rival kind of clans or tribes or, or collectives of predators um uh and um and and introduces kind of like species variation within that um and then in prey there's a whole new different like type of predator um in prey there's only one predator that we meet and this predator uh, has been called on the internet um as i've seen it uh the feral predator um because this one's um it's um this one's much more uh he he doesn't use kind of um there's like the 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 earlier predators they use like energy weapons in terms of like their their guns they're all very knifey and melee weapons kind of focused but um in terms of their long-range weaponry it's it's like energy-based weapons Whereas this predator um, uses uh, like metal darts, um, and, I, and like it's all like, and there's just like this this look that is the kind of it's somewhat more. Um, it reminds me more in terms of it, feral, like it reminds me of the kind of cliche image that I get of the. Uh, the American kind of huntsman who's like, you know, um, who's a sports huntsman basically. Um, and there's, there's something, something of that in the image of the feral predator. Huh? Yeah. That's <laughs> so he doesn't travel through time. 
No, it, it's not a traveling through time yeah. thing. As far as I'm aware, I, I, there could be fan fiction out there where it's it's um, pr- the predators are traveling through time. It, um, it, uh, is this uh, movie supposed to be in the past or is it present or is it unclear? The, so Prey is set in um, 1700s, I think, if I remember correctly, or is it 1600s? I forget exactly when Prey set. Um, it's um, yeah. I'm not. This is where my my. I, I'm just gonna brush it off to dyslexia and just go like, <laughs> like I just can't remember sequences of numbers. Um, yeah. Um, and then the uh, the, f- the original Predator film is set um, in the uh, kind of in the time when it was done. Same with the second one, um, and then same with the alien versus predators and they're all kind of um done to their time if that makes sense yeah for sure their decade yeah all right well so yeah i guess i should have watched the movie before conducting a, <laughs> a interview about it but you know what can you do it's i mean I don't know that your life will be drastically improved by watching Prey alone, but I can guarantee you that it will be by watching all the Predator films. And well, let me tell you the type of shit I watch. So <laughs> Go on. I religiously watch this TV show called Naked and Afraid, which it's a survival show where they drop two people off. Well, there's a naked and afraid and naked and afraid XL. But anyway, they drop two people off naked in the middle of a harsh uh, climate, harsh environment. And that person has to, those two people have to survive for 21 days with only two items. Uh, Sometimes that's a fire starter and a knife. You know, sometimes it's a pot, a net, fishing hooks, but they get two one each and yeah so considering that i spend more hours than i have watching that kind of stuff there's i think 11 seasons or more uh maybe prey would be an improvement in my life i'm the the, the thing that really grabs me in terms of what you just what you just said was that you you watch it religiously like Yep, it is uh it is my spiritual exercise to watch two people survive in the wilderness. What's what's the kind of the 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 religious aspect of it? Where's the where's the divinity in Naked yeah. and Afraid? Well, uh I'm bullshitting now, but <laughs> uh actually it kind of touches on something you said earlier about like uh enjoying the victory uh and the overcoming of not the environment because the environment stays there and uh, remains what it was, but the overcoming of themselves. Yeah. And uh, I actually don't get too much satisfaction, like Freud and Schaden or whatever out of uh, seeing people when they lose. It's really about uh, the perseverance that I like. Yeah. And that's, that's the thing that I, um, appreciated about prey is that kind of individual self overcoming that um and that's it's also something that um it was that there was a, a thing that i wanted to do into um breath night rebellion is that kind of thing about uh individuals um overcoming who they are um through their will to power um, and there's something about that that I, I also really resonate with and find beautiful um, and enjoy spectacles of um, that I've never seen Naked and Afraid, and, and I don't know that I will. Um, but, yeah, there's, there's something about that that is um, that I think is, you know, I, I appreciate um, some level of heroism um, in, a, in a way where it's like I, I think about... Um, one of my biggest um, inspirations, um, I say biggest inspirations, one of my most significant inspirations um, for 
as long as I've been kind of really interested in indigenous resistance is uh, Pemulwuy um, from uh, what we call Australia um, and just find his um, individual will to power um, from the records that I've read, um, which is not much, there's not much on him, um, which I kind of like because it allows me to kind of have this more, um, I'm not clouded by factoidal objects of kind of the, the stories that are generally given by um, colonizers. Um, and just this thing of like really appreciating that kind of heroic um, feeling that I get when just thinking about Pamela and thinking about this individual who was so fucking powerful and so much of a threat to uh, to the um, to the Leviathan that he was rebelling against. That they didn't just kill him; they they cut off his head, and it's you know it's been displayed in museums and shit as this as this thing of the, seeking to kind of try and humiliate his image because he was just that fucking powerful. And there's something about that which I just kind of go like it fucking sucks that he lost for all intents and purposes, but it's still fucking amazing who he was. And there's something about that, that, yeah, I, um, I wouldn't call it a religious thing for me. Um, I know you weren't, weren't really meaning it religiously, but like, um, but there's something about kind of appreciating, uh, heroic individuals who just inspire me and that, yeah. And, um, yeah, there's something on that. I mean, there is, you know, there is biblical stories about <laughs> that carry that theme for sure. And I, obviously as anarchists, you know, we uh, anarchists have this tendency to appreciate the beautiful loser, as Aragorn would say. And, um, uh, and the struggle to um, overcome that sort of, uh, affinity that a lot of anarchists will form with the sense of losing to, <laughs> to get to a place where winning is actually what we focus on. <clears throat> and, you know, Star Wars or a lot of, a lot mm. of sci-fi will deal with this, uh, underdog, uh, winning. And it makes you wonder about the people who don't like that, <laughs> which, uh, who, you know, like it when the strong win or uh, they want the empire to succeed. Yeah. They want to make uh, America great again. Yes. I, there was an individual who I, who I knew years and years ago, years and years ago, um, it was actually, it was noticeably, he first said this about Avatar. Um, uh, he, um, he enjoyed showing off by saying that he, um, he wanted the humans to, um, to eradicate the Navi and, um, and to get the unobtainium and, uh, and to uh, claim victory in the film. He, he wanted that. And, and he was also like very inclined towards um, a right wing politics and a kind of like nationalisty type right wing politics, and from a family background of um, of, of armed forces and uh, and with that and there's something yeah that's that's yeah that kind of wanting the uh, wanting the big, strong, also very macho, masculine, male yeah. figure to um, to well, win. There's something about that in that. It's very common on the right. Or maybe yeah. I shouldn't say very common, but it's definitely more common on the right than on the left. Um, yeah. I, I think it's actually somewhat central to the nationalist project, which... I consider the right wing to be. Um, do you, 
is there not a differentiation um, in your thought between um, kind of nationalist type right wing and then kind of the libertarian, which I, I I've never experienced um, oh. libertarian stuff as being uh, kind of nationalisty. I think it's a little so in my mind, I actually question whether libertarians should be considered right wing. Mm -hmm. um, unless they are nationalists, because yes, there, I don't necessarily agree with the division between right and left, uh, being on the, the question of the economy. Mm -hmm. I think that, uh, nationalism is a much bigger factor there, especially now because the right wing will refer to liberals as globalists as opposed to nationalists. And that's here. That's also, you know, with Brexit and everything. Um, so the libertarians, I, th they're like, I think the right wing to them are useful idiots because they, the, um, the obsession that some on the right have with constitutionalism and uh, minimizing the state where for them or for what I consider a more like traditional right winger that has to do with tradition. It has to do with the sort of like the essence of what they think America is, so to speak. But for a libertarian, it's utilitarian. They see the shrinking of the state as being a way to increase the market. Okay. I, I, I guess I, um, you know, I don't really believe in it in there being much of a differentiation between the left and the right, and I don't, um, and, I, and I don't really like doing those kind of that kind of talking. Uh, it's it's very ideology, um, but I just um, I notice in people I know as individuals, um, the individuals who I know who I would consider right wing. Uh, and who are very kind of libertarian right wing, as I in my language, um, who are kind of pro, um, like pro market stuff. Um, they come at things from a very different space to um, to the kind of nationalist statey. Um, right wing in the in the way that there is that differentiation between them um, I do find there is a there's a commonality there where I would if I if I'm invested in this kind of in this mapping out of thought which is left and right I I, I, you know, I guess I might perhaps um, stupidly put it together as right but yeah, but I, I, guess, I could be full of it. <laughs> well, no, it's, I mean, it's, I don't know how many people agree with each other about that division to begin with. I don't think it's like uh, very strongly defined for me. It's like, I don't. So classic liberal is a term that libertarians will sometimes, sometimes employ. And the reason why is because they're going back to John Locke and to these original thinkers of liberal democracy or uh, in America, the, the Republic or what have you. And it's almost like everybody that was a liberal democracy in favor of that versus the church uh, shared the type of ideology that they want to return to until world war two and the, um, the establishment of, uh, the nanny state, whatever you want to call it. And to me, anything that happened, well, basically the rise of socialism to me is what defines the birth of any kind of left to begin with. And, um, Yes, that's an economic thing, but it's also a historical thing because it's 
uh, it's sort of like the left emerged as a reaction to what the classic liberals wanted. And so a classic liberal today wants to return to a pre-socialist idea of what the nation should be, I guess is the way I see it. Hmm. And that's a very different headspace than uh, the, well, the Christian nationalists who are still nationalists, but they want a basically a theocracy. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. It's slightly on off topic, but something that just, it strikes me as interesting. Um, uh, with, with this and just my, um, I don't know, uh, perhaps I most amuse you um, is that the last time that I really encountered um, John Locke being referenced um, kind of positively or negatively um, was uh, in a piece of writing done by the uh, Extinction Re- rebellion uh co-founder and kind of the main public image originally of extinction rebellion um and who ended up kind of getting kicked out of extinction rebellion for um for being a shithead um was roger hallam and in the original um in the original uh piece of writing for extinction rebellion their kind of cool to rebel for the the original rebellion in London. I can't remember what year that was. Um, He cites uh, John Locke as the greatest philosopher. I I think in history, he he called it the greatest philosopher and um, was was referring to Locke's um, uh, contract theory and how the... um, the British state isn't keeping up with its side of the contract, so we need to do civil disobedience to get the state to stop going That's... warming. Um, and it was just this this thing of like, you're doing fucking environmentalist conversation and your greatest philosopher is John Locke. And and it was just it was it was a point where it was just like and it was it was really because before the right when things first started happening with Extinction Rebellion, before the original kind of the big events and spectacle in London, um, I was invited to get involved. And I and I was for like three or four days. I was going like, oh, I'll see if I'm going to get involved. And like, and I was asked to like proofread this document. And I was just like, and I, I put it back there saying like, try to channel it like, saying, is this really the thing that this group wants to be putting out? And it was just kind of going like, <laughs> It was disregarded that feedback. It was like, like yeah, like we we just we we we're, we're sticking with the thing of social contract theory. Oh John Locke God. is the greatest philosopher of politics, like you know, and um, and it's and then very very quickly after that, I was like, no, I don't want to be involved in this thing. Thank you very much. Yeah, no I, kidding. I particularly seeing what Hallam was going to be like, and um, and he kind of went the way that I expected with that, sadly. And yeah, and his, his political kind of um, career went from Extinction Rebellion to a, a political party called Burning Pink. Um, and uh, yeah, but it's just, it's just, it's a bizarre thing of this, um, of this now kind of global, is it? I don't know. This this movement um, mm-hmm. uh, which is supposedly um, doing a conversation or a rebellion regarding radical environmentalism is founded, founded on fucking classical liberalist kind of Jeez. ideology. At and least it's not Thomas Hobbes, but... <laughs> yeah, but, but, you know, it, it, you just kind of go, what the... F- what the fuck yeah so, so you know which i don't think is where most of the individuals who are like part of this movement part of the collective where they're coming from but it was just this thing of like shit this is your politics you're 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 not doing the direct action to do the direct action you're you're wanting social contract theory to go your way yeah and that's it's just, 
Yeah. That's pretty fucking incredible. Yeah. It was, it was, it was a bizarre thing. I don't know if I still have a copy of that, but it'll be probably on the internet somewhere. Like, yeah. The, the original call to rebellion. Um, it was just, it was really, really bizarre. If you find that, let me know. And I'll, <laughs> yeah, I'll put it in the show notes too. Um, I, I'm not going to go looking for it because after this, ah. after we finish here, I'm oh. having dinner and then I'm going, I'm, I'm, I'm off in the wilds for several days, um, staying with some friends like, and I'm going to be with, with trees and away from the internet. So um, if I get back to it in a few days time, and I remember if you send me a message, I'll try and find it. All but, right. um, but yeah, but it, it's not something that I'm going to be hot on. <laughs> well, speaking of what we're doing after this, I actually am running out of time myself. I'm going to go work on getting buff at the gym. And uh, I am all, I'm doing a weapons training for this really uh, old martial art that's basically dying out, but it's called Hoten Ryu. Anyway, I got these blisters from um, using the wooden sword, the Boken. And so I got to get weightlifting gloves so that I don't irritate them at the gym. So that's what I'm doing. (laughs) Okay. Uh, um, Is there anything else you want to let people know about before we uh, call it quits? The only thing I want to say, and it's much, it is, it's not really talking about something. It's just if someone's gonna gonna watch this and they're going to, you know, they want to read, Bretton Knight Rebellion, which I think has been like certainly been the thing that I've wanted to talk about here, and that's been my my thing of kind of this, you know, in terms of what we've um, doing this thing of a podcast conversation, like is the thing of like it is not perfect. And it is in many ways absurd and stupid. Um, And it's not been done to do something that's like, I've not intended it to be any more than what it is, if that makes sense. And to just um, like, people want to critique, critique. Um, I just, I I, I hope that people approach it with an openness and a kind of, and a, you know, a willingness to be with something that is, messy and not perfect and is one um fucking ridiculous uh creatures attempt to as part of their attempt to survive uh being here on this um colonized archipelago and um you know amidst like fucking global warming and all that so that's that's it's kind of an appeal to kindness from your audience that's, 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 I guess, the, the thing that I, I, I'm going to end with there. All right. Well, thank you very much for coming back on the show and uh, letting us all hear about in deep about your art and writing and um, everything you've been up to. So, uh, yeah, until next time, everybody have a good one. <laughs>